Greetings and peace, everybody. Thank you so much for coming back. And as you've seen, I have the honor and privilege of having Sheikh Wahid Azal from the Fatimiya Sufi Order come back for a part two of this uh, talk that we're building on together. Part one of this talk, we talked about Islam, Sufism, Freemasonry, uh, elements of the Hashashin. And part two, I have the honor and privilege of Sheikh Wahid Azal coming back to explain the tarot and different aspects of Islam and how it's all tied in together with these different systems. And it's, uh, it's, it's an honor and a privilege for me to be able to host this uh, great brother, great leader and great soul. And I greet him with the greeting of Assalamu Alaikum and Noor Alaikum from the Fatimiya Sufi order. Wa alaikum noor wa salam on, upon you and all your friends um, and all the people watching this program. Uh, thank you very much for having me back on again. So, you know, let's let's talk about some really interesting stuff tonight. Yes, definitely, Sheikh. Um, I wanted to talk about the Kabbalah and basically the system of the tarot, but we have to give some historical context and I'll kind of preface everything by first saying the following, is that I have noticed, especially over the last 10 years, um, in the conspiracy subculture online and offline, um, a anti-Semitic bias against the Kabbalah itself, even amongst people who otherwise should know, should know better. Yes. So, you know, whenever the question of, or the issue of the Kabbalah comes up, you know, ooh, you know, you know <laughs> New World Order and all the various anti-Semitic conspiracies come right out. Um, I don't subscribe to any of these. I am on record for being a staunch anti-Zionist, yeah. um, but I am not an anti-Semite by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, anti-Semitism is a disease of the mind, uh, like other forms of racism. Um, and it also takes away, in, you know, it, it takes away the possibility of appreciation for a system such as the Kabbalah that is extremely rich and deep. And because it comes out of the Abrahamic tradition, um, it robs its critics, especially in the Muslim world, of the possibility of not only dialogue, yes. uh, but also enhancing their own understanding of the universe uh, and, and what have you. Because um, the Kabbalah, as I'm going to disclose in a moment, as belongs as much to Muslims as it does to Jews. Mm -hmm. um, so I will start here, and I have said this many times before, and there's a lot of scholarship uh, to back me up on this. The Kabbalah, the system of the Sephirotic Kabbalah, right? The system of the 10 spheres and the 22 paths um, actually originates in the Muslim world, right? That is not to say that we didn't have a system of Jewish mysticism or Jewish Gnosticism mm -hmm. prior to the system of the Sephirotic Kabbalah. In fact, we do. Um, up from about, I would say about the, just one century before the birth of, of, of Jesus Christ, up to about, we would say, let's say the eighth or ninth centuries of the common era, the predominant system of Jewish mysticism and Gnosticism is a system known as the Hekalot. Mm. Uh, and the Hekalot is the system, um, it's a very Gnostic dualist system, and it is based on the visions and the speculations over the throne chariot of God, the Merkava, yes. uh, in the visions of Ezekiel. So the, the book of Ezekiel of the Bible plays a very central part in the speculations of that school. Um, but we don't have anything resembling the system of the Kabbalah until about the ninth, 10th centuries of the common era. Mm. And the scholarship on this is now becoming pretty firmly established, contrary to what a lot of believers say, uh, etc. cetera. Um, this goes for texts like the Sefer Yetzir, or the Book of Creation, the Bahir, the Book of Splendor, and all the way to the Zohar, which is now the central text of the Kabbalah itself. These don't have antiquity. Um, and even though they don't have an antiquity, they don't, it doesn't take anything away from the system as such. <clears throat> because in that melting pot of late antiquity, and especially the melting pot of the Abbasid years of, of, of you know, the Islamic Empire, there was a, uh, a incredible fusion uh, and intellectual discourse that went on, especially in Baghdad. And this is where the genesis of the Kabbalah is now pretty much is, it is a consensus amongst the scholars where the Kabbalah actually originates. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and apparently it originates in the circle of a very eminent Jewish uh, scholar and philosopher by the name of uh, Satya bin Ga Gaon al-Fayumi. He was uh, the preeminent rabbi of Baghdad mm -hmm. uh, during the, the most of the 10th century. 
He dies around the 940s of the Common Era, and his circle of students um, is now pretty much recognized were the progenitors, as, as if you would, of what we know as the system of the Sephardic Kabbalah. Mm. And where the influence, the, the primary influence on the system of the Kabbalah comes from with the 10 spheres in the past is very likely the philosophy or the metaphysics of a very eminent Muslim philosopher, Abu Nas al-Farabi. Mm. Abu Nas al-Farabi was a Turco-Iranian uh, born in what is now today Kazakhstan. And he traveled from his homeland to Damascus, where he spent most of his life, which was at that time uh, in relative close proximity to Baghdad itself. There was a lot of scholars going back and forth between these two cities. So scholars in Baghdad were interacting with scholars in Damascus. And the influence of Al-Farabi, who in the Muslim world is known as Mu'allim al-Thani, the, the second teacher, um, was overreaching, you know, because what he did was, although the texts of, you know, philosophy, Greek philosophy and whatnot were being already translated, the commentaries and the discussion and the teaching, for example, over the philosophy of Aristotle uh, or uh, what in the Muslim world was known as the theology of Aristotle, which was actually the, the Aeneas of Plotinus, um, these played a very central role in all Muslim philosophy and metaphysics from that point forward. And the real mover and shaker of all of this was Abu Nasr Farabi. And Abu Nasr Farabi exerted a direct influence on the circle of Jewish scholars within Baghdad itself. And you see this primarily in the way that the system of the Sephardic Kabbalah is structured. Abu Nasr al-Farabi, based on his reading of the metaphysics of Aristotle, um, posited from the Godhead or the unmoved mover, as the Aristotelian texts talk about it, a series of 10 intellects that descend all the way uh, from the eternal realms all the way to the temporal realms, the last of which is what he designated as the active intelligence, which is the in sublunary intelligence responsible for the creation of the material world, the Agla Fa'al. And the Agla Fa'al was also associated subsequently by the school of Farabi and also Avicenna, who was heavily influenced by Al Farabi with the Archangel Gabriel. Um, we see this then being exerted, this, this idea of the 10 intellects proceeding from the Godhead, exerting a direct influence in the way that they then structure the system of the Sephirotic Tree of Life. In the Sephirotic Tree of Life, you have 10 spheres vertically descending from the, uh, from the Kether all the way down to Malkuth. So from the crown all the way to the realm of the dominion. Mm -hmm. And within these two realms of, uh, of, of the Kether and the Malakuth at the bottom, you have the same archangel occurring, uh, which is the archangel Metatron. Yes. Or according to the, the speculations of Kabbalah, the supreme manifestation of the Shekinah. So this was the interfusion and the cross intellectual cross-fertilization that was happening between Muslims and Jews in Baghdad at that time. These people lived together, ate together, um, in many cases even married amongst each other, even though within both Islam and Judaism there are these prohibitions against marrying outside of the deen, outside of the faith. But in the Baghdad period, um, a lot of this was, was, was going on um, until, you know, we see around the 10th century, certain texts start to emerge in Hebrew. First of which is the text known as the Sefer Yetzirah, the Book of Creation. The Book of Creation is a very interesting text. Um, I've meditated on this text for years, and the scholarship that has been coming out over the last 20 years on the Sefer Yetzirah is proving very decisively that what the Sefer Yetzirah is, a text that was attributed to the patriarch or the prophet Abraham, peace be upon him, um, is actually a, uh, a pericope, a Hebrew pericope or redaction of the pseudo-Apollonian text in Arabic known mm -hmm. as Sir al khalqiyah the secret. So it became, they took, they were inspired by this text, which was attributed to Apollonius Satyana, and they formulated this whole cosmology of letters and numbers and spheres and realms, etc., in Hebrew, right? Now, most Orthodox Jews will like, disagree with it, but the scholarship, like I said, the historiography on this is tight. Um, the second text that emerges out of the Sefer Yetzirah is another influential Kabbalistic text known as the Bahir, the Book of Splendor. 
this also emerges out of that circle of, of um, uh, Judeo-Arabs or the Mu'arabs of, of, of Baghdad. So the formative, the seminal texts of the Kabbalah all have their genesis within the Muslim world. The system of the Kabbalah itself is directly influenced by the philosophy and the metaphysics and cosmology of Al-Farabi. So um, this is, a, I should emphasize this to, to, to a lot of the Muslims who are watching this who get on, you know, really uneasy and weird whenever the Kabbalah is brought up. Um, given these facts, the Kabbalah is very much our system as much as it is for the Jews. Yes. Um, so why shun it if the very genesis and the birth of this system occurred in our part of the world amongst people who are living amongst Muslims, right? Yes. Then as we move along through the centuries, around, um, around the 14th century, a group of uh, very eminent Jewish Kabbalists and, um, and activists, one of whom actually traveled all the way from Iran to Spain, um, congregated around a figure in northern Spain by the name of uh, Moses de Leon. And these individuals were responsible for writing the text that later came to be known as the Zohar, the Book of Splendor. Um, although the book itself attributes antiquity to these ideas, and particularly to a rabbi in the first century by the name of uh, uh, Rabbi Akiva ben Yochai, uh, the fact of the matter is that the genesis of the Zohar itself occurs in northern Spain, uh, just you know, a few decades out from the Reconquista of, of Spain by, by the House of Aragon. And at that time, you had uh, you know, a lot of activity amongst even the Jews within Andalusia, they were heavily influenced by Sufis and the school of, for example, of Almeria, uh, who are the direct influences or the, the intellectual influences on a figure such as Ibn Arabi. And Ibn Arabi himself, as I will discuss shortly, is also a central figure of the Kabbalah, primarily for this reason. In one of his most important works that he wrote in the Maqr, uh, before he came to the East, it's a book known by the Book of the Fabulous Griffin, Kitab al al Mughrib wa Shams al Maghrib. And in another book that he wrote almost immediately after this, known as the Book of the Encompassing Spheres, Kitab in Sha al Dawair, he posits a tree of life of 13 spheres and 32 paths. And when I first saw a model of this back in the um, early mid 90s, I was absolutely floored because it was at that time that I was getting in, you know, reading Kabbalistic texts, you know, and comparing them uh, with Islamic philosophy, especially the philosophy of Sohrawardi and Ibn Arabi. Yeah. And when I saw this tree uh, of Ibn Arabi, it absolutely just took me. And I spent years contemplating both trees together. Mm. So I was using the Sephirotic tree of life and the model of the, of the Jewish Kabbalah mm. together with Ibn Arabi's. Now with Ibn Arabi's, he, he didn't attribute any letters or numbers to these paths. Um, in the book of the fabulous Griffon, this tree becomes kind of a, uh, a meta-historical kind of structure for the dialogues of the, uh, of the names and attributes of God uh, in, in this book of the fabulous Griffon. So I worked with these for years until I had an aha moment back in 2005, where out of these two trees, I basically melted both of them together into one tree and formulated my own Kabbalah which is known as the tree of reality. And I mm -hmm. published, self-published a grimoire uh, at the end of that year uh, entitled Liber de Catriarchia Mystica, the book of the 13 mystical spheres, um, where I basically took the Sefer Yetzirah and rewrote it from the prism of the philosophy of Ibn Arabi himself. And this has worked for me as a system, and this is the system that I primarily use. It's, it's the fusion of the two trees, the tree of Ibn Arabi and the Sephirotic tree of life. But I continued my research, I continued to, to, to read. Um, and what I am finding is that much of the received opinion, whether about the Kabbalah or the system of the tarot uh, within occult circles is actually wrong and ahistorical. Yes. For, for example, um, we, there is no evidence until probably around the 18th century in Europe of a system of divination around the cards of the tarot. This all emerges within the 18th century in Europe. Now, playing cards, the taroshi or the narobi that was very predominant in North Africa and also in parts of Palestine uh, from about the 10th, 11th century all the way to the 12th century, suddenly 
to find themselves in Italy around the middle of the 14th century. So playing cards, right, in the way that we have them, emerge in Europe at that time. Now, the, the issue that scholars con continue to debate with each other is that whether these playing cards um, evolved in the tarot or the tarot was something separate to them, in two articles that he published, I think before his passing, um, the late scholar Gerald Elmore yeah. uh, published two articles about Ibn Arabi and the tarot. And the second of these articles is especially illuminating in what he has uncovered, um, where he believes that some, some of the major arcana cards in their origin actually resonate with certain elements of the philosophy of Ibn Arabi. And this absolutely floored me in the way that he he set this out. I think what I will do is I will upload these two articles somewhere and then, um, you know, you can link them in the, in the description box of the program and people can go and download them and read them for themselves. Yes. Um, because this basically is a game changer in the dialogue of discussions uh, between the Western Hermetic tradition active today and those of us from the Muslim world who are looking deeply to see the origins of a lot of the elements that these people are engaged with. Mm. Um, so this is the pl place I would start. And then after reading these art articles, then I would go back, for people who have no familiarity with the system of the Tarot, I would go back to the book of Eliphaz Levy, who is the man really responsible in the 19th century for putting the tarot as a system front and center. And this was the book he wrote, Transcendental Magic. And the first section of the book, which is divided into 22 chapters, is actually about the tarot itself. The second chapter, the section of the book is more about practical magic, etc. But the first section, in my opinion, is the pivotal uh, section of the book that people should go and read and meditate on, because it's very important for how then the tarot develops. Uh, over the next 100 so years. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with Aleister Crowley and his Telemann <laughs> Golden Dog, but I will give the man his due. His Book of Toth is a very important book on the tarot, even if one doesn't take everything the man says as scripture, which I definitely don't. Um, it is important to at least read this book and to c contemplate some of the things he says it. Don't take it on face value, because I think Aleister Crowley gets a lot of things wrong. Um, including some of the switcheroos that he does between the cards. Um, but nevertheless, this is an important text to read and meditate on and even get the cards and play around with them, you know, and, and see uh, what comes of them. A lot has come for me from, from playing around with these cards. Another book I would highly recommend for people to get is a book written anonymously by a Catholic priest. Uh, we don't know the, or, uh, the actual identity of this person, but they wrote a very influential book called Meditations on the Tarot, a journey into Christian Hermeticism, where um, the author takes a very Jungian, but also a very deeply esoteric approach to the 22 trump cards of the tarot. The, these are the books I would go and get. And maybe uh, Lon uh, Milo Duquette's book on, on Crowley's book, The Toth Tarot, that's also a very good book. These are the central books to, to read and meditate on the tarot. <clears throat> and also don't take anything that these people say on face value, because since the system of the tarot in the way that we have it today, um, historically cannot be located any further than the 18th century, right? Mm -hmm. That means that everything about the system of the tarot is up for debate, up for change, reform, the whole kit and caboodle. Um, and, but it's, the tarot is very important. The symbolism of the tarot is a mandala that I think people should would do well to meditate on, uh, even if they don't agree with every elements of it. But it is one thing that I have done for years is to basically let Quranic symbolism and Quranic imagery and Quranic archetypes dialogue with the tarot. Mm. And the results have been amazing for me personally. I mean, I have a whole practice, you know, uh, with doing istikhara with the Quran and doing the tarot, yes. you know, and then having these two inform each other about what is going on. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'll let you talk a little bit because I'm talking too much. Go it's ahead. it's interesting, Sheikh, that you mentioned that because uh, one time there was a um, a consultation going on with a lot of murids and they were consulting their Sheikh here with the Tariqa in Philadelphia. And uh, they were asking Sheikh, is a tarot considered, considered haram in Islam? And he said no, because divination was a part of consulting in Islam. So he was correct on that part where 
there was aspect of uh, tarot and these different things that were going on. So a lot of his Western disciples kind of felt good about that because they thought they were they were committing shirk. So th- th- there is some truth to that aspect of divination and how it's all tied to al-Islam and how there there's many uh, Sufi groups here that I've seen also, uh, different sheikhs of the different tariqahs who encourage this kind of a healthy um, divination and dissertation between their uh, murids so they can continue to build upon this aspect of al-Islam that many in the modern Muslim world have forgotten. Because, yes. you know, we're, we're living in that same paradigm, Sheikh, where anything that's not been, uh, I guess, programmed into them, they consider it's haram. And it's, it should be a little different than that. You should be open-minded, know well, how much Islam has contributed to the world, to these different esoteric groups, to, to the West in general. And that's that, uh, you know, love and idea that I have in common with you to defend the true Islam, no matter where it comes from. And that's exactly uh, what we have to do. So I, I agree with you completely on these different books that you laid out in terms of the research and all these different things that one can get started to realize what is this true Kabbalah? What is the true tarot? How is it tied into the golden age of Baghdad and these different elements? I remember even uh, reading the story of Sheikh Abdul Qadir al Jilani, who is yes. a, a, a Persian Sheikh going to uh, yes. um, uh, Persia to Iraq. And a lot of his teachings and his influences were in Baghdad. So it's, yes. a, it's a very, very powerful place. I remember when before he entered the gates of Baghdad, al Khidr appeared to him yes. and told him, you're not ready yet. And he had to wander the desert and get himself ready spiritually. And then he was allowed to come back to Baghdad to become a teacher. And another, another book I would recommend, Sheikh, is The Secret of Secrets by Sheikh Abdul mm. Qadir al-Jilani which was, I believe, uh, written originally in Arabic, but yes. it was then translated, discourses. Yeah, then it was translated yeah. into uh, English by a sheikh from the Jarahi Tariqa. And it's interesting, the dream that Sheikh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani has, which confirms a lot of like where you stand on as well, where he was having trouble speaking Arabic due to his Persian heritage. Yeah. He had a dream of Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, putting the, um, uh, I guess, part of his saliva into his mouth Yes. Help him with his Arabic. And then Ali, uh, peace be upon him as well, came in his dream and put this, his saliva as well. And it was interesting. That's what got him started on those dreams and divinations and his own destiny that he was meant to fulfill. I remember, uh, Sheikh, when I joined the Sufi Tariqa here, it was uh, around after 30 days of uh, doing the Tariqa, I had the dream of Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in my Mashallah. dream. He came in my dream. So I was sitting in the middle. He was sitting on the right side and the sheikh that I took the bayat under was sitting on the left side. And Masha. after that dream, I was, uh, it, it, was, it was something amazing. And I know many in the uh, aspect of the modern Muslim world, they would tell you, uh, you know, how is that possible or uh, all those different things. And they consider it haram, they keep it to yourself. And I asked the sheikh, sheikh, this is what, what happened to me. This is what I saw. And he said, uh, that, that's a blessing. And, and I asked him, is it haram? To share this with anybody he said no because nabi muhammad وسلم, also interpreted dreams so you're right the aspect of the tarot that they consider haram and aspects of different dreams that they, they say oh don't talk about it you're right we need this open-mindedness not just in the west but in the muslim world well this is i mean the golden age of islam was when they were completely open to this stuff i mean you you know how do you i mean this approach that you have by the by this a this Generation Salafists and Wahhabis, yeah. um, Diobandis, etc. Even you know Diobandis actually unfortunately come out of uh, uh, Sufism in, in the subcontinent or the Barilevis, etc. Yeah. Uh, but in the Golden Age and even until maybe about 100, 200 years ago, all these groups were open to ideas constantly because we have Hadith that say seek knowledge even if it be as far as China. Yeah. You know, and at that time, the tr- time of the Prophet peace be upon him, China was the furthest end of the earth. Mm. So the prophet was telling the Muslimin, look, you know, if knowledge comes from the furthest end of the earth, seek it. It's knowledge. Mm. It comes from God. Everything is, you know, everything is, 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 is Islam. Everything is submitted towards the spirit, mm. towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So nothing is outside of Islam as such. And this is something that it's very difficult for certain people to get their head around. You know, what does that mean? You know, Islam is the name of the religion. Yeah. But with the Sufis and and also many esoteric Muslims who weren't part of any tariqah, 
Islam is an existential condition. It doesn't even necessarily refer to the deen as such. Mm. Um, it means that everything is already always submitted towards that spirit, right? Yes. Now, where the obligations are, of the Sharia are concerned, these, at least in my opinion, from my reading of Hadith, you know, on both sides, both Sunni and Shia, uh, the obligations of the Sharia are very straightforward. They, they, they relate to the individual, right? Shirk is a very specific thing. It means worshiping that which is circumscribed. But shirk can be anything. You know, shirk can be your ideas about yourself. It could be your car, your house, your job. It could be anything. All of these things can be shirk if you worship them. Yes. Um, playing with tarot cards or engaging in the occult arts, um, especially if you have a good teacher that can show you the ropes and not, you know, guide you through the pitfalls. None of this is, is haram. You know, there's no, um, at least from my reading of the Hadith and the Shia collections especially, there is nothing that, that, that the infallibles ever said that, you know, you should not engage in this stuff. And they also offered um, much of material to work with and yes. to build upon. The most important symbol in the whole of Islamic occultism is a symbol of the greatest name that I have emblazoned as, as my, uh, on my wall profile on, on yeah. my Facebook. That comes from Ali, alayhi salam. That, is, he was, that was transmitted by him. Mm. So if it is transmitted by, by Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salam, who are we to second guess them? Of course, you know, some of the mashayikh and shuyukh in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf and whatnot might beg to differ, but that's their problem. You know, we don't have to listen to these people. That's don't know exactly what they're right. About. Yeah. That's exactly right. You know, it's interesting because when I went to Pakistan and I saw all the different tariqahs there in Karachi, in Lahore, in Islamabad, they're, they're all, the first individual that they give tribute to is Ali alayhi salam. He's considered like the grand master of the Sufis. Yes. And, it, and, and it's absolutely interesting how it's all correlated. And you have this Sun, both the Sunni and Shia Sufi communities that are, they're basically friends and are learning from each other. As much as like, you know, you hear about the, the negative press or the bad news by the agents of chaos, because they don't want unity within Islam. But if you go yes. to a lot of these different places, especially where there's knowledge being spread, they're not asking them, like, what sect of Islam are you? They're saying, if you hear you believe in Allah, you believe in the messenger, etc., all those things, the Tawheed, then you are a Muslim and you're here and we're brothers and we're here to learn. And I think over time, that's what's going to happen, Sheikh. It's, it's going to be like um, the golden age of Salahuddin as well where it didn't matter which sect you were. If you were Muslim, you were the cause of defending Al-Islam, then you were under that banner in an umbrella. And I Although hope- I, 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 have, I have problems with, with Salah al-Din Ayyubi personally, because he was the man who ordered the, the martyrdom of Shahab al-Din Yahya Suhrawardi, the master of illumination. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my great heroes uh, was buried in Aleppo. Unfortunately, his shrine was demolished by these Takfiri lunatics uh, during mm -hmm. the war in Syria. Um, but I got to go there uh, during 2008 and, and pay my pilgrimage to the shrine of the Master of Illumination, Sheikh Ali Shraq. Um, Surawardi was put to death at the orders of Saladin because of the influence that he was exerting on Saladin's son, Malik Zahir Shah, oh, in right. Aleppo. I didn't know and that. These, yeah, and these doctors of the law, these fuqaha in, in Aleppo wow. feared this man and his influence. Because, and he was only a young guy, a 36, 35 year old young guy from uh, Iran. And mm -hmm. um, Saladin sent his son an ultimatum, put this guy to death, he refused. So Saladin basically forced his son. He says, you know, you, you deal with this crazy Iranian mystic or I will, you know, I will move a garrison into Aleppo and depose you myself. That, not, <laughs> so, now that, that makes sense why the Hashashim put a dagger under his pillow. Yes. There were some elements, I guess, which were not totally about that unity. Yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. Thank you. I didn't know about that. Yeah. Yeah. So Saladin was the, was the executioner of the master of illumination. Great, great mystic philosopher. He is one of the most interesting characters of that period. A man who fused the names of Zarathustra with Muhammad, peace be upon him, who... Um, brought the worlds of Hermeticism, Neoplatonism, and, and Zoroastrian theology together into a coherent system known as the Illuminationum Ishraq. Yeah. Uh, and he also is a very important figure in the genealogy of Kabbalah because mm. in the 13th century, when the son of Maimonides, Abraham 
Maimonides, was active. After he succeeded his father, he encountered the works of Sufawardi through a convert, a Jewish convert to Islam by the name of Ibn Kamuna. Mm -hmm. Ibn Kamuna was a philosopher in his own right. He was a Jewish convert in Baghdad to Islam. And he rediscovered, oh, after about seven years after the death of Sufawardi in 1191, he came to Aleppo and basically retrieved all the works of Sufawardi that were still existing and took it back with him to Baghdad. Uh, so we owe this man a, a immense debt of gratitude for, for, for you know, the preservation that he, he did of the works of the Master of Illumination. And yeah. um, then these works started to circulate amongst the Jewish communities in the Middle East, everywhere, and especially in North Africa. And when Abraham Maimonides enc encountered the works of Suhawadi, he was absolutely gobsmacked by, by what he beheld in these works. And so he began to um, recommend not just the works of Sufawardi, but Sufism to his correspondents, these early Hasidic Jews in Europe. And it is as a result of some of these works that were circulating that you find some of the very formative, uh, developed Kabbalists of that, you know, second generation around, you know, the, the early 14th century, late 13th century, such as Joseph, uh, Joseph Kikatala, yeah. who write works such as a work known as the Gates of Light, Mm. where when you read this text carefully, you see the influence of Sufawardi within a Kabbalistic text such as this. And this is all thanks to the work of, of Ibn Kamuna and Abraham Maimonides, the son, the mm. son of the Rambam. Um, these are very important issues I think people need to take in mind. Only now in the last 20, 30 years within the academic community um, are they being written about and, and scholarship is being undertaken to bring these points of history out. Uh, for some reason, amongst a lot of practice, practicing communities in the West, they're kind of behind the times uh, over this stuff, but they're catching up, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. And it, it, you know what's, what's absolutely interesting about all of this, Sheikh, is there is a balance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this universe and this world with. And you will have these periods of ignorance, darkness, then you have these renaissances and golden ages. And then things kind of go stagnant, they go down. And now we see how the world is now more interconnected, more than it has ever been. You and I could be on opposite side, sides of the world, but it's like we're sitting right next to each other and sharing our light brotherhood and just knowledge with each other. And that's the most important thing, as I see the young generation, even in America, that there, there's a difference in their mindset and their expectations compared to the previous generations. So I think over time, within my lifetime, if Allah gives me the privilege to witness that or see it, I will see the aspects of that golden age return where people want truth, liberty, justice, freedom, unity, all those aspects of what all of these different schools of thoughts are teaching you all across the globe under that one umbrella. And even what our prophet, peace be upon him, said, everyone become one ummah. It doesn't matter who you are, what you believe, become one ummah. As it says in the Quran that all well, mankind is what but one brotherhood in Surah mm. 49. One so soul. Think, one yeah. soul. Nafsin wahidatin is what it says at the beginning of the Surah that we created to nafsin wahidatin as mm -hmm. a single soul and then separated it into nations and tribes in order to know each other. So even closer than, than the brotherhood. We are one. One soul. The universal soul is 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 who we are, just dispersed into different bodies. Yes, I absolutely agree. There's somebody uh, that's a close friend of mine, and they always say the aspect of we are all just one being, that everything is absolutely one being. And it's basically, uh, we're, we're in these different avatars, but it's just this one being that's experiencing the love and light, moments of anger, grief, doubt, suspicion, all those things that come in the human nature. It's all uh, basically trying to understand each other. And that's the, that's the beautiful thing that even um, Ibn Arabi uh, tells with us about basically, um, I guess, Allah sent himself to himself to himself. And yeah. this aspect of everything is just one, Allah had one. Mm. Yeah. Except the, the world of phenomena also serves a purpose because there's a, there's a sort of a, how would you put it, a divine economy of sorts in this world of multiplicity and spatial temporality for there to be a division. Um, and that serves its own purpose. There's an there's a ecology involved to that. So when we say all is one, yes, it is on the ultimate level, but on the, on the level of phenomena, uh, 
there is a multiplicity, there is a division, and this all serves the purpose of the Almighty itself. It's to experience, it's for that one soul to experience all these divisions. Yes. All these multi multiplicities, if you would. Um, because what is the purpose of creation? The purpose of creation, as we have in that very famous Hadith Qudsi, when the Prophet David, peace be upon him, to the Prophet David, King of Israel, asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why did you create the world? Ya Allah, what was the point of all of this? What's the point of this exercise? Yeah. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala respond with? I was a hidden treasure and I desired or loved. Ahbatu and Arif, I desired to be known or loved to be known. Therefore, I created the world in order to be known. Yes, that's absolutely. so. The whole animating purpose of, of, of creation of life asked from the mouth of the prophet of Israel itself, the king prophet of Israel, is this that it is the purpose of, of, of creation is to for God's love to of, of himself or itself through the, the, the loci, the multiple locus or multiple loci, situs of, of, of its own manifestation mm. within. The temples of, of man and woman. Mm -hmm. Adam and Hawa. Yes, yes, that's absolutely correct. And it's just that balance where even on the Kabbalistic uh, tree, Sheikh, if you look at it, they have the mm -hmm. aspect of uh, order and chaos, darkness yes. and light. Because one cannot exist without each other. It was an interesting conversation that I was having with a, a store owner right up the street from my home. And we, we were having a conversation that even Iblis, Audu Billah, Rajim, even on this realm, that he cannot do anything without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's permission. No. So there, yeah. is, there is that balance between order and chaos and why certain things are allowed to happen and why both good and evil, like it says in the Holy Quran, that we will test you with both good and evil. Yes. And, to us, and to us, you shall be returned. So yes. we have to realize that there is the balance how even in Freemasonry, you have the black and white tiles, good days, bad days, bad days, good days. And everything kind of makes you the being that you're meant to be through your trials, tribulations, challenges. And I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. It's a, there's another way of putting it. We don't have to even get into the loaded question of good and evil. The way that most Sufis put it, and especially the way that even Arabi puts it, is as such. There is the reality, and then there's the reality of contraction, right? Allah subhanahu blows existence into being and then it returns in, in the you know in inhalation back to himself. Um, another way to put it is that the polarity is actually between Jalal, majesty, and Jamal, mag beauty. Mm. So um, there is no chaos in the universe. Mm. In any, I mean there is no randomness in the universe. Uh, there's there is no evil in the universe. Everything, even hell itself, serves the purpose of, of, of the Allah. And incidentally, in the Quran, <laughs> who is guarding the gates of hell? It's not demons, it's 19 angels. Yes. 19 <laughs> angels guard <laughs> the doors of the entrance of hell. So, which means that even hell itself is in the service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, absolutely. And it's so interesting, uh, Sheikh. I was listening to a, um, a program recently of the gentleman that I recently interviewed. And he had a, uh, a woman on his program that talks about like a lot of this, um, I guess, trauma and alters that she's experienced. And she had a, a vision one time where she said she saw Lucifer, Iblis, Archangel Michael, and some other angels all sitting on the sofa, basically hanging out together, <laughs> both, both knowing each other's purpose and what they exist for. And there's another individual I know who's on the left-hand path from the Inferno path, who I interviewed on my channel as well. And he said, uh, ever since I invoked Archangel Michael, I've had peace in my life and on top of this other uh, stuff that he's into. So there, you're right. There is that aspect of even the angels guarding the gates of hell and how the angels play a part in each lives of our existence, whether these people are on the left-hand path or the right hand, or it doesn't matter. It's all interconnected in some way, shape, or form. And there is a relativity of some kind, which I believe your average believer or your average muslim or even your um average person that's in the lodge system or any of these esoteric systems it's not it's not in their comprehension yet well number one is because they you know unless you are on a spiritual path like this and have an initiation yes uh this kind of bigger picture doesn't even occur to you you mm. you're you dealing with the mundane now, i i i hate to 
phrase it in such an elitist way, but unfortunately, this is the reality of things. You know, once one begins to walk a, a esoteric path like this and begins to push one's horizon and expand one's horizon, then these sorts of things start to make more sense. And not just intellectually, but also out in the real world, you begin to see it and experience it, taste it, as, as, as the Sufis always say, to taste the tajalliyat. These are all the tajalliyat. Now, going back to Iblis, there's a saying, famous saying by Ahmad Ghazali, a very famous Sufi, uh, left-hand path Sufi, by, by the way, who was the younger brother of uh, Abu Hamid al-Ghazali. Mm. And he says, and this is quoted by Masinyon in his uh, four-volume study of Hallaj, where Ahmad al-Ghazali says that uh, everyone who walks this path is a mushrik until the day they learn Tawheed at the feet of de the devil. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're right, right. That's that's absolutely correct. And I, you know, looking into um, Ibn Arabi Sheikh uh, Baba Muhayyuddin, um, I'm right here in Philadelphia where the Baba Muhayyuddin Mosque is, and it's uh, it's so interesting how even this man, they don't know where he came from. He emerged from the jungles of Sri Lanka, and these people from the west they found him and brought him here. And his hours of dissertations in uh, Tamil, they translated into English. And uh, everything, when I went to go tour the, uh, the masjid, the majority of his disciples were American Jews. And mm. they, re they reverted to uh, Islam or uh, Sufism, you can say. And their descendants and their descendants are still preserving this fellowship and this aspect of maintaining his mazar, his community. And it ties in perfectly what you're saying about the golden age of Baghdad, where Jews and Muslims were coexisting, co-marrying. The Bawa Muhayyuddin uh, Mosque here, I, I believe, is the, the finest example in the modern day century that I've seen. I've been there, yeah. And it's, and yeah, it's, and it's so, so amazing that you know, we see this situation where you have this aspect of unity. And there are communities here that demonstrate that, even though they might not get a lot of spotlight. So it's, it's amazing that you pointed that out. It, spotlight doesn't matter, you know, I mean, I, you know, for myself, I moved away a long time ago from wanting to have spotlight, because that is nafs, right? Yeah. Um, there's a saying by Ali alayhi salam, you know, for anyone who gets on the path, find the truth first, seek the truth, find it, and only then will you find its people. It's not mm -hmm. the other way around. You don't go looking for a community in the hopes of finding the truth. You find the truth first and then the community emerges. From, from your findings. So, you know, people should keep that in mind because, you know, there's a lot of people, there are a lot of people seeking, there's a lot of people seeking fellowship and it's completely justified. I completely understand, especially in these times where, you know, our lives are becoming more and more and more atomized because of the way that, that the modern world operates. Mm. And there's less and less fellowship and community. But if you get on a spiritual path, it serves your purposes better to find what you seek first, seek the yes. pearl. Find the pearl. Once you find the pearl, then those who also have found the pearl will also emerge as your brothers and sisters. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. And it's basically the aspect of being on the path of believing. And yeah. believers you can find everywhere. That aspect of good people and bad people or believers. I've seen that it's, it's all over. All races, religions, countries, groups of the world. I've been given the privilege from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to visit different countries, interact with different cultures. And this human element is usually the same no matter where you go. So you have to, that's right. It's like the quote that says, when the student is ready, then the, the teacher appears. Teacher appears. So yeah. it's, it's absolutely amazing that on this path, you're always going to be where you're meant to be, people that you're meant to come across, things that you're meant to do. And an aspect of, uh, you know, what they call maktub, even in the, uh, yes. in a lot of these books, they call about destiny. And in the Quran, it talks about believing that everything is kind of written. And you have to play your part, knowing that you just have to stay true and, not, and avoid dunya, shaitan, the nafs, and all these things that kind of tie you down and keep you in this uh, circle, like a dog chasing its own tail. And you have to basically rise above that, rise above the the terrestrial sphere and become one with all of these things around you to know that it's all it's all an illusion to many extents like with me shape the only thing that makes me happy is to bring people together unity 
I never cared about these things that the modern world kind of puts on you, that you have to uh, get a degree, get a career, move, move in a nice place, like chase after money, do all these things. It never brought me happiness. I go to the park in the mornings, I sit under the tree, I pray. I pray for all of the Ummah. That's what brings me peace and happiness. And that's exactly the world that we have to strive for. And with me, however long that I'm meant to be alive in this lifetime, I have to do the best that I can because it's all of our responsibility to teach those that have not been taught. And it's not their fault. A lot of them, it's not their fault because it's the power structure that never taught them the truth. Like in the school system, we have to... It's like individuals like yourself, you know, I'm honored that I've interacted with you and we're able to share this knowledge and share this gift with the world. Of course, there are elements and agents of chaos that will stand against you, but inevitably the good is always destined to win. And yes. I, I play a lot of these, um, these games and a lot of these stories. And in the end, even the, the bad guys know that the good is always destined to win. But even they're seeing that how much they can get away with before Allah basically wraps, wraps the scroll up with them. And that's just the beautiful thing about this journey is that yeah. what you're doing, what I'm doing, what other people of the Noor and the light are doing, they are going to win. And no matter what, it's going to come yeah. a time, even if they don't see it within their lifetime, but their work, the seeds that they're planting, they will bloom. And I, I have yes. faith in that. That is always the way of things, no matter what. The, the truth always wins. Now, there's that great saying, you know, the wheels of justice uh, turn slowly, but they grind very finely, you know. <laughs> so one way or, or another, the, the, the justice will come. Yeah. Um, what we have to be detached from is our own role in it. You know, mm -hmm. that I want to be there. I want to prove it. I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to. Okay. <laughs> get, o get over the I want to. And everything will happen according to the plan of the Almighty Himself, or yeah. itself, or herself, as I usually interact with the Spirit <laughs> as a female. As, as, so um, it, it's all good. But nevertheless, we do also have to play our part, you know, and we also have to listen to our intuition. And when one gets on the spiritual path, years and years of inner work finally allows you to listen to your intuition like you're, you're uh, taking your GPS from your phone. Your intuition becomes literally your GPS in, in every situation. So it tells you that under heaven, there's a season for everything. There's a season mm -hmm. to be angry. There's a season to be happy. There's a season you know, to do this. There's a season to do that. It's not just all one. Why? Because it is all one. So your anger is part of the, of the stream. Your happiness is part of the stream. You know, your falling from the path is part of the stream. You're getting back on the path is a part of the stream. It's all part of the same thing. Just ha keep that faith, deepen the faith, and not as an intellectual axiom, but as a really lived, felt, experienced reality around mm. you, 24-7, right? So that you begin to see everything around you as the manifestation of the names of, and attributes of, of Allah subhanahu I want I want to share something with your crew because I think it's important. A lot of occultists, uh, even in the Muslim world, they are very... A greedy with their secrets and, and their methods. I want to share a method of how I do istikhara with the Quran. Um, yeah. This actually came to me about four and a half years ago during Ramadan um, as I was reading the Quran, the Surah Al-Nur. And once I came to the 24th verse, the Ayah Al-Nur, which is one of my favorite ayat in the Quran, it just, the book itself projected this method of how to do divination, bibliomancy, with, with the book itself. It's absolutely beautiful because there's so many different methods out there. Some of them work, some of them don't work, some of them are effective, some are not effective. Mm. But this one has worked for me very well. It's a very sophisticated system. Basically what you do is that you sit, first of all, get into your center, and then you visualize the symbol of the greatest name. Mm. And then you recite the Fatiha. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, malik yawm al-Din, iyaka na'budu wa iyaka, then you visualize the letter Sad. When you visualize the letter Sad, now say Bismillah wa billahi 
wa minallah wa ilallah wa mashallah. And as you're saying this, visualize and keep your question that you want to ask the book in mind. Then, very subtly, right, put both your thumbs in the middle of the book, right, and then let it scan. And when it is absolutely ready, don't force it, bring the book and open the book. Mm. Once you have opened the book, right, the both verses at the very top of the book, on the right hand side of the book, on the page right hand side, so the verse on the right hand side and the verse on the left hand side are relevant mm. to your question. The one on the right hand side is the Jalali element, the majestic element to your question. The verse on the left hand side is the Jamali, the beautific element of your question. So this is how then you begin to, to unpack the question. Number one, the first thing you do with both of these verses is that for each verse you calculate the number of the verse by the surah of the verse, right? Once you have calculated these two numbers, that's the first element of your, of your answer. Whatever that number means to you, that is the element of your answer. Then you count the number of words in the ayah, right? So let's say there are 18 um, words in the ayah. That is an element of your answer. The number 18 means hay, what? The living, alive. <clears throat> then you count, count the number of letters to the verse. That is another answer. Then you combine, calculate the number of words by the number of letters to the verse. And you do this for both sides, for both the Jalali and the Jamali element of the question. Then if it's still unclear, then you calculate the numerical value of the entire verse, right? On one side, then that on the other side. And if they're still unclear, then you combine these two combined numerical values into, into one. If the number exceeds the number 2001, right? Because 2001 is the ultimate number of, of a single divine name that we can attain, which is the name Mustaqas, mm. the aid invoke. If it exceeds that, so if it goes to 2002, then you reduce the number to, to four. Mm. And what is four? It's the letter Dal. What does the letter Dal refer to? The letter Dal can refer to a lot of things, but the letter Dal uh, is the last letter of the name Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the middle letter of the name Adam, mm. peace be upon him. Or you can now then begin to interact with other elements outside of the Quran itself, the tarot. What does the letter Dal refer to in the tarot? It's the card of the Empress. Mm. And so there's your answer. Yeah, that, that that makes complete sense. And you know, it's so interesting because even with um, 787, with a uh, square and compass in Arabic, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, if you simplify that, that adds up to 22 and that's simplified to four. So even the aspect of the square and compass comes back to that same equation. So it's it's all it's all relative. It's as much as like all of this, all of this circle tries to go outside of it, it all comes back within that circle in that one stream, like you said perfectly. And what is four, besides the, the, the numerical value of the name Muhammad, four refers to the four archangels of the throne, but more importantly than even that, it refers to the four phrases, the tasbih al-Fatima. Mm. Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. And that's, that's one of the, the zikrs of Baba Muhayyuddin. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. Now, I have gotten so much out of these four phrases. There is so much secret, so much, so much spirit and theophany within these four phrases that we all utter every day. First of all, each of these four phrases, as I also explained in my lecture in Berlin, each of them refer to four worlds. Mm -hmm. Lahut, subhanallah. The next one, alhamdulillah, refers to the world of the Jabur, the world of the uh, archangelic intellects. The next one, La ilaha illallah, the tahleel, refers to the angelic world, the world of the malaku. And Allahu Akbar refers to this world, this world of the nasut. Now, when you take these four phrases, right, you look at the first letter. The first letter is what? SubhanAllah is sin, sin. And the last letter of the phrase, which is from Allahu Akbar, is what? The letter Ra. You put the first letter and the last letter together, what do we have? Sir, secret. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely correct. And it's, you know, it's like you said, all, all relative, all part of that one stream. 
And that's the most beautiful thing that even myself, Sheikh, I didn't know about the Kabbalah and the tarot being tied to Al-Islam. And even myself, knowing what I do, I, I didn't know those things. And I would like to continue to expound on those things, like in terms of istikharas and all those things, divination. How can one continue to use the tarot and the Kabbalah in the aspect of Al-Islam the, the proper way, like you have stated? That's just, just how I just explained it. When we have these four phrases mm -hmm. of the Tasbih and Fatima and these four worlds, within the Kabbalah, we have four worlds, within the Sephirotic Tree of Life, the world of the Atsiluth, the world of the Briya, the world of the Yetzirah, and the world of the uh, Asiya. Mm -hmm. These four worlds correspond exactly to Blahut, Jabarut, Malakut, Dasut, right? I've actually um, written up a Kabbalistic commentary on the Bismillah itself, um, which you can yeah. actually find on my Academia EDU page, where I actually lay all of this out um, about how it works. And then you did, then you let these two systems, which are actually the same, um, talk to each other. Yeah, and the results are amazing, amazing. Yeah, Alhamdulillah, and it's beautiful you're sharing that. And for the viewers that are watching this. I will put all of the links below for Sheikh Wahid Azal's blog spot, his Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and his uh, academia page. And a lot of these things, as you know, with the type of information that he's sharing has been suppressed by the enemy and the, the darkness that doesn't want him to share this information with humanity. And it's pivotal. You check out his work and you support it. And it's just like what the Sheikh is teaching us. I was reading the uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh the other day, mm. which they say is like the first uh, literature ever recorded for mankind. And in that literature, Gilgamesh, like uh, I found a lot of Masonic elements in it too. But it, in, in the book, basically it teaches you that there was this man who was chasing eternal life. He was chasing all of these things. He was chasing women, fame, the best king that ever existed. And then he got questioned with his own mortality. Then this, uh, this being came in, Kaidu, who then he uh, basically learned brotherhood from, and then he felt uh, uh, agony and uh, basically fear after he had died. And then after that, he journeys, he gives everything up from his kingship and he journeys. He basically, I saw him becoming a Sufi where he kind of gives everything up and lives his life like in a very aesthetic way, goes from one corner of the world to the other. And then he comes to this realm where you cannot cross the waters. And then he finds this guy with the boat who helps him cross the waters and go to the other side. And there he meets this man who basically is the um, epitome of uh, Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, like, you know, from their version. And they call him Yutna Pishtam. And he asked him that, what can I do to live forever? He, he said, you can't. He said, just make the best of the life that, that has been given to you and realize the good that you did will always last forever. And then when he goes back to his uh, hometown, he realizes that I made a city for my people. I made these large walls to keep the invaders out. I made a farm for them so they could continue feeding their families and do the agriculture. And that gave him the satisfaction that me rather having eternal life, I see my people being happy that I left something behind for them. And that's exactly what all, the, all these people on the path, they realize. It's like what Sheikh said, you have to take me, me, me out of the equation. And that's exactly what uh, that came in my mind when you mentioned that was Gilgamesh's story, where mm -hmm. he had sought everything, but then he realized that what you do for others is basically what immortalizes you and how they continue to remember you. Like all these great teachers that we mentioned, Ibn Arabi, Baba Muhayyuddin, and all of the prophets and saints, peace be upon them, that to this day, thousands of years later, we're still talking about them and they're still going to continue to be talked about. And I, I appreciate and I am very thankful that you shared that epiphany with the viewers. You're very welcome. In fact, one of the um, biggest um, realizations I ever had was um, during a time where I was invoking the name Mobit, the taker of life. This is about five, six years ago. And the, the, the realizations were just incessant, you know, about certain things, you know, seeking death of the self is actually what gives you that eternal life. You yeah. know, death, there, there is a lot of mystery in death. And it's interesting that just, you know, this last week that went by, when I unraveled the name of Baphomet, you know, and, and transposed yeah. it into the, to the Arabic letters, 
um, you know, what jumped out is one of the highest secrets of, of all any initiatic path, and it's that these letters spell out, you know, the, the sentence Pajit Mot, and death answers, you know. Well, death usually doesn't answer, but the death that does answer is the one that is transformative. You mm -hmm. know, it's the one that, that where you have actually earned that death, mm. right? And so what you have, what you seek in terms of what a lot of people seek in terms of self-aggrandizement, which never comes to them and in fact goes the opposite direction. When you seek the death, the true initiatic death, right? What the prophet of Islam says, die before you die. When you seek that and it happens to you, then you answer. You are the death that answers. You are the death to this life that is answered in the life eternal. So mm -hmm. whether your body is here or not, it doesn't matter. Just like Baba Muhayyadin, who some claim was several hundred years old, yes. you know, and that he came out of the jungles of Sri Lanka. Well, I'm here to tell you that is absolutely possible. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe modern science hasn't yet attained that understanding of how it is possible. Yeah, but uh, there are many stories and much evidence of many, much many Oliya, not just in the tradition of, of, of what we know as Islam, Taoist masters, etc., living several hundred years, what have you. These are not superstitions. These are true. They can happen. Um, it all depends on the quality of your of your suluk, um, and whether the grace from above bestows something like that upon you, so that, for example, you could sit in the jungle for six hundred years meditating, at the end of which you walk out. And then share your realizations of 600 years with a group of disciples as Baba Mu'ayyad did, did in, in the United States. Yes. It's all true. There's nothing false about it. And, that, you know, the most beautiful thing is the aspect of the, um, these, these initiatic systems. And it's funny I keep bringing up Assassin's Creed because I, I was playing it last night. And one of the games, it's uh, the, one, the one that's in Paris. And one of the missions, you have to go to this church and you have to, like, solve this light puzzle. And in that light puzzle, then this chamber opens up and then you have to jump inside the chamber. And when he sees this uh, council of the Hashashin that welcome him, then they say, is, is this the path that you really want, the path of the eagle? And he said, yes, I want it. And then there's a, a, a potion in the middle of the, of, the, uh, of the chamber. There's a potion and there's like two goat statues, one on the left side, one on the right side which reminded me a lot of uh, Baphomet and the aspect of death that you mentioned. And when he drinks this potion, the, the man starts hallucinating and he sees his life flash before his eyes. And then he sees like these paintings where uh, it's, it says it in Latin, where he's, uh, he's born from his mother, then he has adolescence, then he grows up. And then the last painting is called Mortis, which is death. And then he, yes. has, to, he has to take this like huge jump, like the leap of faith from this huge tower into the, to the bottom to start his life. And that's basically what starts his journey, that you have to leave everything who you were to start this new journey that you with your free will cho are choosing to walk this path, knowing the rewards and consequences and the struggles and the good times, bad times that will come with it. And it's, it's so interesting, the aspect of die before you die and Baphomet, all these things that are it, when the average Muslim looks at it, they think it's the shaitan, they think it's evil, but it's like what you said, it's the lack of knowledge and them not being able to be exposed to these things. I, and it's, I, good to be, it's good to be exposed to these things. On the other hand, there also has to be what we call an istidad, a readiness mm. for these things, because a lot of people are at a certain place at certain periods of their time that they cannot really properly digest this stuff. They need experience hard knocks and then that hard knocks will make them prepare them um for understanding of these things yes. you know, one of the things that that our ancestors understood perfectly well but in this modern age we don't appreciate anymore is that pain toughness hardness these are good things these are good things for experience you know people who've had hard lives and have overcome it right have more experience and understanding and wisdom about the nature of the world than some kid who spent his whole life in a lap of luxury and his parents did everything for him and sent him to the most expensive school. These mm. people don't learn anything about life and at the end of their lives or in even, you know, in the middle of their lives, they, they suffer from it. And this is, in my opinion, one of the reasons why in the West we have had such an explosion of mental illness over the yeah. last 50 years is because people have lost the capacity to be toughened 
to live, for example, like their own ancestors in America has lived on the land. A hundred years ago, if you went to the prairies of the United States amongst these farmers and whatnot, these people couldn't even conceive of the concept of depression or, you know, yeah, occasionally melancholia, sadness would visit them. But because they were living off the land, they were living by their own means, right? They, they, this whole thing about mental illness, they didn't even have time for. They didn't mm. have time to be mentally ill. Why? Because they didn't have time to sit around and ponder about, you know, woe is me. This is the, one of the problems in the modern world that we're living in is because every, all the amenities, everything is provided for us. And those of us, for example, who come from the middle class or, and on up, um, we are more focused on navel gazing than we, than we are on the bigger questions of life, right? And so this is one of the reasons why in a proper Sufi order or in any proper initiatic study, people are put through austerities, mm. right? Or even if you're not part of an order, if you decide, if upstairs decides that they're going to initiate you from above, they put you through a turmoil period. You oh, go yeah. through what they call the dark night of the soul. This is, you should relish this. This is the, the all high, the grace of, of the all high is upon you when you are going through a dark night of the soul. That means that you are being built. It's an alchemical process. Mm. And what is in the seven valleys? of Sufism. Um, Attar, Bariuddin Neshapuri wrote this great story called the, the uh, Conference of the Birds. In that book, he's got these seven valleys. The steed of the valley of love is pain. If you, you cannot attain your object of, of, of love without going through mind-bogglingly pain, pain that is going to destroy you from the inside and then transform you alchemically. Yeah. And if, if we put this, if we compare this to the alchemical process, what is pain other than the process of calcination within the alchemical great work? And without calcination, you do not uh, you do not accomplish a very important element of the of the process of the solvent of the dissolution of the elements. Yes. For the next element of the process to coagulate the elements back into the constituent form. So don't flee pain. Do not flee it. Pain is good, so long as you know or are guided into how to deal with your pain mm -hmm. and come out of the other end, pain is the best thing that can happen to any person because you come out to the other end like a phoenix rising from its own ashes. Yes, that's absolutely right. And it's so, it's so interesting, Sheikh, that you mentioned that because this reminds me of Rumi's quote that you have to keep breaking your heart until it opens and there's a wound and that's where the light will enter. And it reminds me a lot of one of my good friends who's a... Pakistani from a Sufi Tariqa from Pakistan and he's living here now and throughout his whole life he had a life of luxury he didn't have to worry about rent bills food his father God rest his soul in peace now had given him this card to spend to his heart's content whatever he wanted whatever he wanted to do and then after he got married after the age of 30 and had a wife and a child then the Sufi elders from Pakistan from their Tariqa instructed him that you move away from your family move to a different city, leave everything, and you will work for what you have to provide for yourself, provide for your child, for your wife. And he's doing construction work now. And he said, now I know how, how people are making an honest living, like doing backbreaking work to raise their families. And that's why the sheik, what the sheikhs had instructed him from Pakistan, that this is what we want you to do. And maybe they had a precognitive vision of where this was going to lead him and he's uh, much better now alhamdulillah where he was here struggling with spiritual issues and now he's moved away several states away he's making an honest living his own halal money awesome. taking Very good. family and I, that's you're absolutely right sometimes the whole system has to come crashing down for you to build something back up better yeah the ca the card the tower of the tarot Mm -hmm. That is a great car to contemplate. People, it scares, this card scares the living, living daylights out of a lot of people whenever it comes up in a reading, but it's one of the greatest cards in the whole deck. I have dealt with this card so many different times. I, I don't even want to remember how many times, but it, it, it teaches you. Every time, you know, you, you're at a place and it just, everything falls apart. Uh, you are forced by upstairs, you know, to basically then put it all back together again. And yeah. this is part of an alchemical pr process. I mean, one of the hardest things for me in, in recent times was the passing of my wife because I was there. My daughter 
mother was there when this all unfolded. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was heartbreaking. And I'm, you know, I'm still dealing with it with my, with my nine-year-old and, and trying to get her to you know, digest and understand all of this. But it taught us a lot of things. First of all, it brought my daughter and I closer than ever before mm -hmm. to the point that you know, we almost telepathically communicate with each other, the two of us. Yeah. Um, I know where she is. She knows where I am. Um, and these are good things. Tragedy from tragedy always comes something better. Mm -hmm. So never flee it. You know, if you if tragedy comes to your doorstep, embrace it. It's the best thing since, since sliced bread, literally. Yeah. Let yeah. it happen. And that, that's that's beautiful because uh, this relation that you're teaching your daughter is basically very important, Sheikh, because I see here in the Western world, especially here in America, like a lot of these people that I went to school with that didn't have well, uh, mothers or fathers and they didn't have that system in their house where they were being taught this spiritual discipline. And I see how they turned out. So this is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that your daughter has somebody like you of your caliber teaching her, guiding her how to be a good human being, what to expect and how to be independent and down the road when you, your life takes turns and you become an adult and have a family of your own. There's so many things that questions that arise in one's mind. And there's a individual uh, when I used to work in the Philadelphia area, and he, he was on a spiritual path as well. And this gentleman, I seen him in situations where he would look at somebody. He came to my store one time and he looked at this woman and he described her whole life to her. And she freaked out, like, who is this guy? And she, he, he basically told her that your father is currently incarcerated and you need a male presence in your life. Spend more time with your brothers spend more time with the male figures in your family. And she started crying, like, who, who are you? How do you know these things? And what I noticed about this man is everywhere he go, he had his daughter with him, whether it's for uh, all of his personal stuff, his business stuff, everywhere he went, he always takes his daughter with him. And I said, I, and I asked him like, you know, sir, why do you do that? If you don't mind me asking. And he said, it's because I want to teach her how to deal with this world in terms of order, discipline, when to hold stock in yourself, know what is right, what is wrong, how she sees me dealing with other men, how to deal with men, how to deal with women, and how to deal with the world in general. And I was like, you know, may God bless you and make everything go good for you and your daughter. With that, that is a good mindset. That is a good parent. That is a good father. Yeah. yeah. Re really, I'm striving to do the same with my with my little one. And inshallah, we, we will succeed, you know. And inshallah, I mean, the plan is that one day, uh, if it's if God wills it, that then, then she basically takes over from me. Yeah. Um, and uh, because it is also the time for the, for the female mashayikh and the mm -hmm. female leaders of the spiritual path within the world of Islam mm. to step forth. You know, th this age of patriarchy needs to go out. It, it is, in my opinion, the age of Fatima, you know. So um, we needed to go through this process for the last 1400 years. And by the grace of God, when we come out of it, we will be all the better for it without compromising on anything, you know, yeah. and that is our alchemical process collectively as a civilization. That's absolutely right, Sheikh. And you, you, you're absolutely correct on that part that the divine feminine is very neglected in Al-Islam. And even to the credit of the brotherhood, where last year there was a Muslim brother who gave a lecture on the divine feminine in Islam. And it was very well received about this, this esoteric relation between Prophet Muhammad, Ali, Fatima, peace be upon them all. And how basically all of these lights are kind of coexisting with each other and they all serve a, a special kind of purpose. And it's very important that we are headed into that age where you are basically having a, the divine feminine in your life through your wife, God rest her soul in peace through your daughter, who's going to be the future leader of your tariqa. And even one time I had a woman like that come to that same store. This was a, a you know, not, not, not the man, but the woman. And she even told me that down the road, this was like so many years ago. I mean, I'm still not married, but she told me that one day you will have this female presence in your life in terms of a daughter. And you will teach her the same exact things that what you're doing. So we're all on this path that somehow, some way that we're gonna transition this leadership into the hands of the divine feminine. And maybe we'll see, maybe we will see that day in our lifetime. Inshallah, I'm, I'm confident we will see it. Bef before we go, I wanna give an interpretation in one of the greatest symbols that is shared commonly 
uh, between the pagan tradition, Freemasonry, and the world of esoteric Islam, and that is the pentagram. Yeah. The pentagram is a very important symbol to us. Yeah. And what does it represent? You mentioned um, the names. In the world of Islam, number one, the shape of the pentagram outwardly represents the letter ha, mm -hmm. right? The H, the basic H. Inwardly, it represents the letter wow, which is six. Five plus six is 11, right? Which in, in the system of hermetic uh, magic, it is the symbol of high magic. Now, in the world of Islam, and especially in, in the Bayani Tariqa, each aspect of the pentagram represents one of the five members of the companions of the cloak. So the hand and the pentagram are actually, in essence, the same symbol in different uh -huh. configuration. Right? It's like many societies who use the hand of Fatima. Yeah, or they use the pentagram. From our perspective, these two symbols are the same. It's just a different way of configuring it. So right. Right. the five aspects, outer aspects of the pentagram represents number one, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Number two, Ali, mm -hmm. on the left hand, on the right hand side of the aspect. On the left aspect of the top is Fatima, alayhi salam. On the bottom, the two feet, one is Hassan alayhi salam, and on the other hand, on the other side is Hussein alayhi salam. So the pentagram is Muhammad, Ali, Fatima, Hassan, Hussein, the panchtan, the, the five companions of the cloak. Mm -hmm. That is the symbolism of the pentagram, which then also they refer to um, six names, with the sixth name being the inner part of the of the pentagram. These are the, the six names that you find in a lot of the circular talismans originally attributed to Ali, alayhi salam. And these are the six names, Fat, Hay, Qayyum, mm. Hakam, mm. Ad, Qudus. The single, the alive, the peerless self-subsistent, the judge, the just, and the holy. MashaAllah. Yeah, that's, it, it makes perfect sense. And before we conclude this talk, Sheikh, is there anything for this episode, for our part two, that you would like to leave the viewers with, where to find you, how to support you, and anything else you would like to conclude with? Just put my uh, my details in the description box of the video, and if anybody wants to contact me through either my Academia EDU page, through YouTube, or through my uh, blog, uh, they're more than welcome to do so. Thank you so much, and uh, please uh, follow Sheikh Wahid Azal on his YouTube and uh, realize that his voice is being suppressed. Share his knowledge, share his, uh, his uh, Twitter, his Facebook, follow his work, follow his teachings. And because it's all, collectively, we have to do this work. You might, ha you might have all of our leaders that are doing what they're doing, but the collective work from humanity has to fall on your hands too, the Ummah. So everyone has to do their individual part if they want to see a better world. So we're here supporting each other. And that's all. I will say, let me say this before I go. The suppressing that is coming is coming from one particular group that has also then enrolled others into the, their dirty business. And these are the Baha'is. Uh -huh. And I think at some future point, we should. It serves, I think, the interests of, of both the Ummah and your listeners outside of the Ummah or even in the Lodge uh, for me to explain what it, the conflict between me and this Baha'i organization is all about. Give the whole historical context and also the personal context, because I think more people need to hear this, uh, because they are a very nefarious organization, and they are the primary agents of chaos in the world. And I think even to the disadvantage and, and disservice of many Jews who within Israel have the, this, this organization in the middle of them, in Haifa, on Mount Carmel, which is the holy mountain of, Eli of the prophet Elijah, peace be upon him, they have headquartered themselves there, and ultimately their agenda is even to take over Israel itself. Many Jews don't understand this. Uh, and they are very explicit about wanting to bring about a new world order with themselves as the global government. Mm -hmm. So I think it serves the purposes of discussion uh, to at least at one point have a long discussion about what this is all about and where yeah. the conflict comes from. Uh, absolutely. So we, we did part one, we did part two. And like I said, you're more than welcome to come on my channel to share your truth with humanity, share your truth with the world. And of course, these uh, videos in its raw format 
you have my permission to upload them on your archive them on your channels as well so there's always that transparency that what you're sharing with others is not being edited is not being blocked and what, what you're sharing is being put out there so again i i thank sheikh wahid azal of the fatimiya sufi tariqa for gracing us with his presence like he always does with his love with his light and i will leave all of his links for his uh work in the description below and i look forward to receiving good feedback on this part two and inshallah down the road we will do part three four and so on and so on inshallah with the sure. permission of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we continue this work so i thank you sheikh uh, please keep me and my family in your prayers and I greet, sure. I, I greet you with the fatimiya greeting of noor alaikum wa alaikum noor thank you